this week I wanted to talk about calcium channel blockers, the, you know, the kind that we grew up with, the ones that typically are used to treat high blood pressure, whether that category of medicine might have any use in the treatment of anxiety related disorders, generalized anxiety, phobia, social phobia, panic disorder, you know, anything. The, um, one of the key reasons why I wanted to explore this topic actually is a follow-up to the topic that Sarah Dugan ta discussed a little bit ago about lavender oil and whether that has any bona fide anxiolytic properties. The data on lavender oil suggests that it might. Certainly in animals it seems to, and limited data in humans seem to support that. The presumed active ingredient, the chemical within lavender oil that seems to exert anxiolytic action, is a compound linoal, which turns out to bind to calcium channels. So I was exploring that and decided to look further into whether calcium channel blockers as a class of medicine have any signal for efficacy. So before we get into more of the background or more of the data, just a brief reorientation to the calcium channel. Calcium is an ion. It has actually two positive charges attached to it when it's dissolved in aqueous states like extracellular fluid. And as a thing with a strong positive charge, it cannot cross cell membranes. Therefore, a couple of things happen. One, it contributes to an electrical gradient across the cell membrane. And also, it needs specific channels to get inside the cell if the cell wants to use it for something. And spoiler alert, the cells really seem to want to use calcium for things. Calcium is a really amazing ion in terms of cell function. I'll discuss that in a second. But I want to draw your attention here to this diagram. Um, this is a representation of the calcium channel. It's, it, it's sort of circular, as you can see. And center of it is going to be a pore through which calcium can flow. There are, as many ion channel proteins have, there are many protein subunits, alpha subunits, beta, gamma, delta subunits, and several different subtypes of the subunits. So it's a multi, it's called a multimer. It's composed of a lot of different subunits of protein. And typical of these large transmembrane receptors, there are many specific locations on the protein at which drugs can bind. I'm not going to get into this level of esoteric discussion. Just suffice it to say that the diltiazem family of molecules has a binding site different from the verapamil family of molecules, which is different from the nimodipine, nifedipine, or the dihydropyridine types. So that just to let you know, that's where the calcium, just to sort of reintroduce you to calcium channel from, if you have forgotten it a bit from back in the days of training. And... Again, on the special roles of calcium, not only does it contribute to an electrical gradient across cell membranes, it also causes smooth muscles to contract. So when those cal voltage-gated calcium channels are open, calcium streams into smooth muscle cells, causing them to contract and blocking that action therefore blocks the contraction of smooth muscle cells. That's important to their primary indication blood pressure control because the small arteries or arterioles have walls of smooth muscle and when they relax blood pressure goes down and when they're tonically contracted or narrower than optimal then blood pressure goes up. So that essentially is the mechanism or the rationale for using them as blood pressure treatments. But the really amazing thing from a um, neuroscience or psychiatric point of view is that calcium not only depolarizes cells, but it turns on so many things inside the cell. It can attach to a variety of different enzymes or proteins, causing them to change their activity or their function. It can trigger a number of downstream signaling cascades, which ultimately change lots of different aspects of cell function, including the transcription of a variety of genes. So calcium levels inside the cell are tightly controlled because calcium functions as basically an information molecule or an information atom, which regulates a whole bunch of cellular activity. 
and also interesting for neuroscience and psychiatrists is that the release of any neurotransmitter requires calcium to enter. As a review, when an action potential comes to the end of a nerve cell, reaches that synaptic terminal, the membrane is depolarized, at which point potass calcium enters, which is required for neurotransmitters to be released. So block calcium entry and you block neurotransmitter release. That appears to be, going down to this slide and calling out uh, this one, that modulation of neurotransmitter release seems to be especially strong for norepinephrine. If you look at certain cerebral cortex in vitro preparations, you'll find that it can inhibit that, that calcium channel blockers can inhibit about 50% of the release of norepinephrine. It can also re inhibit the release of dopamine, serotonin, or other signaling molecules as well. In addition to the that, there are these other interesting calcium channel facts that gene I pointed out that I call CACNAC1 is extremely reliably detected in genome-wide association studies of psychiatric conditions. It has a reliable signal for association, a pretty strong level of association, and it's one of these genes which is abnormal in a variety of different psychiatric conditions. Bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are the most notable of the diagnoses or the diagnoses with the strongest association to CACNAC abnormalities, but also that gene variants are associated with autism and major depression. So tells you or suggests that something with calcium channel might have a very strong and relatively pervasive influence on behavioral, on behaviors or behavioral disorders. Also, a study from Denmark cited here in their, in their visual abstract, but also a couple of other studies replicate this finding, looking at very large scale chart review type, type designs found that the prescription of calcium antagonists was associated with a significant, significantly reduced risk of a depression diagnosis later on in life. Other studies have shown that the prescription of calcium antagonists for blood pressure control are associated with decreased risk of any psychiatric diagnosis or of psychiatric hospitalization. There are, of course, other studies that don't replicate that. So it's a little bit of, um, there are some contradicting studies, but I think more studies than not point to this relationship between the presence of a calcium blocker, calcium channel blocking drug and reduced frequency or prevalence of psychiatric conditions later in life when compared to other groups. What else? Yeah, this is a, a whole set of papers came out in maybe the 80s or the 90s. I can't remember exactly the dates, but there were a number of them following some initial reports that calcium channel blockers like verapamil were able to perform on par with traditional anti-manic drugs in reducing manic symptoms in people with bipolar disorder. The the initial reports generated several additional studies, most of which were relatively small, single-site, single-investigator studies um, with conflicting results. Meta-analysis of that is pretty messy, and so it's not a super strong signal. I don't think from my reading of the data that it can be firmly concluded that they are not possibly helpful in some people. So it's basically there was a hotbed, uh, there was a, a cluster of studies looking at calcium channel blockers in bipolar disorder. No very large, very well-designed multi-site trials to answer the question one way or another, and the topic was kind of dropped. So it's an open question, in my view, whether they have use or not. But suffice it to say, it makes calcium channel blockers look, again, very interesting from a neuropsychiatric point of view. Also, the drugs that, are, that you probably know and probably have used off-label, I'm guessing if you're a prescribing clinician listening to this, gabapentin and pregabalin, um, brand names Neurontin and Lyrica respectively, are calcium channel ligands. They bind to one of those protein groups on the calcium channel, influence its activity, and are associated with a host of psychiatric or psychotropic effects, including anxiety reduction. And I mentioned that compound linalool, 
which seems also to be a calcium channel ligand. So there's something there. And so I'm not, I mean, people are commonly reporting on gabapentin and pregabalin and anxiety disorders that are relatively newer drugs. So I'm not going to go on to discuss those. I'm really interested in the, in the question of whether the old school calcium channel blockers, the drugs which, are initial, which were initially approved for the treatment of blood pressure and which are still, to the extent they're used, used for that indication, how do they perform in the control of anxiety symptoms. And data are limited, but here they are. First was a letter written by Goldstein in published in 1985, in which he reports giving either verapamil or diltiazem to seven people that are described as having pathological anxiety and panic attacks. Uh, details are sketchy in this short letter to the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, but Goldstein claimed that there was either significant improvement or outright remission in four of the seven cases. So that actually led to this study in 1988, Klein and Ude, which looked at 11 patients with panic disorder. This was actually double-blind, placebo-controlled, and they used a crossover design. And they gave... People in active drug phase, verapamil, starting at 160 milligrams a day, increasing weekly by 160 milligrams to a final dose of 480 milligrams per day, and maintained at that level for five weeks. They did um, Zung, Z-U-N-G, anxiety rating scale, and found that in active phase treatment with verapamil, the anxiety rating scales had a significant reduction, so general anxiety ratings went down. And in panic attacks, nine of 11 patients, here you can see the scatter plot, placebo versus verapamil, nine of 11 had reductions with, um, uh, with continuous, like in this case, at least four weeks of verapamil treatment. So that crossover designs are a, a lot stronger statistically. So it's, we'll call it relatively small still, but pretty interesting evidence that there may be some some usefulness, at least of verapamil, in the treatment of anxiety and panic, or treatment of anxiety and panic in people with panic disorder, to be precise. Then came a, I don't know what the right word for this is, it wasn't exactly a clinical trial, it was more of trying to look at, I guess you could say a biomarker study. Um, Gibbs was looking, was using transcranial Doppler ultrasound to measure blood flow in the, basilar, in the basilar arteries that supplies the brain. If you engage in hyperventilation, whether you have anxiety disorder or not, you're going to find that basilar artery blood flow goes down with hyperventilation. And if you're a person with panic disorder, then you will have a significantly lower um, blood flow or a or much greater reduction of hyperventilation-induced blood flow. And given that, I mean, that was, that was one of the unique findings from the Gibbs paper, is that panic disorder was associated with a very significantly greater hyperventilation-induced basilar artery blood flow reduction. That's a complicated sentence to say. Um, Gibbs then gave nimodipine to the two patients with the greatest basilar artery blood flow abnormality, and in both of these cases, four weeks of nimodipine was able to normalize that deficit that was associated with a panic disorder, and in one case was associated with remission of panic attacks, and the other case with significant reduction. So super small study, not a placebo-controlled design, so limited but interesting data. Um, Klein and Uda, who you remember from the 1988 study in 1990, I, I actually don't know why, what possessed them to do this, but they just gave a single dose of nifedipine to 13 people with phobia and anxiety and found that a single dose of nifedipine didn't work. Um, the rationale might have been to see whether just blocking things like the force of heartbeat or the rate of heartbeat um, or reducing blood pressure acutely could be associated with anxiety reduction. Um, keep in mind that in every other study that we've looked at, we were looking at multi-week exposure to calcium channel blockers. So no, no significance there from a one-off dose, so um, hard to know exactly what to make of that. And then a case report from Fravita and colleagues show, uh, reported that nipetapine caused a person to have more anxiety. Uh, I wish there were more data to talk about, but that's kind of it as far as I could find. 
and altogether these are intriguing somewhat suggestive at least in terms of the um the biomarker study or in the 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 double blind crossover design however regardless of the study they're all relatively small and not massively convincing for for effectiveness however in the data that I showed you, there is no fatal flaw. I mean, we didn't have a study that was well-designed and showed that conclusively this is a bad idea that doesn't work or causes unacceptable side effect risk. I think personally that if somebody has an anxiety spectrum disorder and has high blood pressure and for whatever reason can't or does not want to take first-line antihypertensives, or even if they can, it may be worth considering whether a calcium channel blocker would be worthwhile to try. Um, and in cases where people have not gotten good results with standard treatments for anxiety, such as SSRI, SNRI, or benzodiazepine or buspirone, and about 40 to 50% of people with anxiety disorders will not get good responses to those things, um, then maybe calcium channel blockers are something to at least keep in the toolbox or consider because they will have a mechanism of action different from the medications which would have failed in these treatment non-responsive cases. Um, and relatively speaking, they have a favorable or tolerable side effect profile. So unfortunately, the data the data are what I showed you. So we don't have any any strong data on efficacy in treatment-resistant anxiety or panic disorder, um, so you're left with that. And altogether, as I as I look at the totality of calcium channel data, considering you know the actions of pregabalin or gabapentin, considering the number of papers that were done on calcium channel blockers for mania control, um, and considering the, uh, a huge a huge number of animal studies that I didn't include, they the calcium channel blocking drugs, and they have psychotropic activity. They, they do something um, that might be worthwhile in some cases, but I don't think we have enough data to know what kind of patient or what kind of disorder or what kind of biomarkers are going to be um, predictive of benefit. In other words, they seem to be doing something, but I don't think we've studied them well enough to know what kind of person or what kind of disorder is most likely to benefit from it. So there you have current status on calcium channel blockers and we will close this lecture here and move on to